Take me back when you were growing up in Harlem in the 80s. Because it seemed like what you guys really did was built, you know, was built around that. Yeah. I mean, the 80s was about, you know, dudes being thorough, um, you know, the music, the hip hop, the scene, um, a lifestyle, right? And it's funny because I'm wearing Pumas right now. So, you know, uh, you know, something that we used to rock heavy back then. But back then, man, it was a lot of fun. Um, I mean, it was a lot of danger as well, especially being outside in the 80s. But it, w it was a good time for music. It was a good time for everything. Um, it was a lot of love. Uh, it seemed like a lot of people got away from things as um, the years went by, but it, it was a great time. Like, I interviewed AZ Faisan. Harlem was Harlem, man, you know. It was uh, fun. We grew up in the Sugar Hill section of Harlem where all the players and hustlers used to be at. So I grew up, you know, around that. You know, and I was working at the cleaners, so all those type of cats used to come in the cleaners. And I was young. And uh, basically, growing up there, you, you, you saw, you know, the streets. Yeah. To me, that's like the mecca of where it all started from. And you're younger than them, but yeah. I mean, when, when crack really hit Harlem during that time, uh -huh. what was the effects that you saw? Um, the, I mean, the, the, the parents stealing, uh, you know, the, the I mean, families being lost, um, you know, even with my family, right? I had, you know, addicts, you know, were in my family, and that's probably one of the reasons the path that I chose happened like that, right? It's just the things that you see and you gravitate towards. So you start seeing these young kids with a lot of money, and knowing that you're from a bad situation, it kind of opens your eyes on a way to do something when school, at, you feel like, isn't the best route. No, absolutely. Like, at what point did you start getting mixed up in the street life? Uh, probably when I was about 13. Okay, now at 13, what were you doing? Uh, you know, I was, in the, I was in the streets. That's where actually where I got my name from, Biggs. Yeah? Yeah, so, you know, I was h hanging with older dudes, um, doing, you know, things that younger guys. All, everybody I hung out with was five and six years older than me. So they used to say, you know, I thought that I was too grown. I thought I was too big for my age. And then Biggs, you know, they just kept that, that nickname, and it's been with me since then. Absolutely. Now, how did you end up hooking up with, with Dame and then later on with Jay? Um, Dame I met when I was 14, and he was a part of a crew uh, called The Best Out that my brother was a part of, and I actually became a part of afterwards. But um, I met Dame, and we used to throw parties all around Harlem. So Dame had kind of left um, Harlem for a second to get in the music game, and he started ma managing Future Sound and then Original Flavor. And when he got them signed to Clark Kent, Clark Kent told him that he had a, you know, a guy that he wanted him to meet because he was in the streets and he thought that Dame would be the perfect person to manage him because he had a take no attitude. So introduced them. They were friends for about a year or so or two years before I met him. Okay. And when you first heard Jay's music, you didn't really like it? Nah, I wasn't. Yeah, I wasn't a fan. Okay. Now, what was the song that you heard when you were like, wait a minute, I got to reconsider well, the time, stance? Well, the time when I thought that Jay was serious, it was a few songs, though. It was um, 95 South, um, Got to Reach the Top, uh, some things that Clark did. But the time that I really, really uh, said that this dude is the truth is when he battled um, DMX and, on uh, pool tables in the Bronx. Right, and Big L was taping that. Big L was taping it, man. And then it's funny because Y was there, and he's like, nah, we don't want no footage. We don't want no footage. And so most of the footage was on Jay because we didn't care, you know what I mean, if he, if he was taped. But so um, the Rough Riders camp and uh, the Harlem Knights, they didn't really want to be taped. So it was, it, it, it was limited footage. Right. Now, who really won that from your point of view? It was really close. You know what I mean? I'm going to give it to Jay. But it's, 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 it's something that, you know, it's, it's been debated for years. Um, like I said, it's when I, I found out he was the truth and, and, you know, the true lyricist that he was. And my brother Bob, God bless him, he was there with him. And we, used to, we kept looking at each other every time Jay say a hot line. Right. Now, at what point did you go from hanging out with him to being like, I'm going to be a one-third partner of this business situation? Um, Dame had a, uh, he brought an opportunity to the best out. And he was telling us um, how we could get into music, how we can do something and use the music as a platform to launch other businesses and how we could kind of take over the world. And a lot of my friends was arguing with him at that point. And some of them was like, nah, I'll just be the boss and I'll pay y'all. When Dane was like, nah, we can do something equally together. So after that next day, me and my brother Bob called him, but I started hanging with Dame a little more. 
and me and him became closer um, than other guys in the best out. And I started getting a little peek and seeing what the music business was about. Um, started traveling with them to a couple shows. Uh, got on a Chitlin circuit, um, kind of like a road manager. Um, it wasn't from, you know, not to really make money though, and I'll bring that lifestyle. So I'll go buy out all the uh, bars, all the Cristal. Um, you know, we park our cars, drive up there, and you know, what I mean, just in, in, enjoy what was going on. So that was my first peek into the business. And once a couple doors was uh, closed and they couldn't get the um, thing signed, they had came to me and asked me if I wanted to be a, a partner. Okay. And you mentioned in an interview, I think with Genius, that you made them an offer that they couldn't refuse. Uh, it, it, it was a it was a great deal for, uh, that that everybody was going to be. Uh, it was mutually beneficial for both sides. Okay, so you put up a bunch of money. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of rumors on how it got started, but um, uh, it, it, it was a great partnership. Okay, and then at that point, you guys became one-third partners. Yeah. Okay, now we know what Jay's position is in the one-third partnership. Like, did you guys work out originally what Biggs was going to do? Well, we did everything collectively, but, uh, you know, even though that... Jay, you know, he was the artist and Dame was the mouthpiece of the business. All the decisions was made by all three of us. So, you know, um, down to videos, down to, you know, which songs come out. Uh, we talked about sequencing albums, um, artist signings, everything like that we did together. But, but what was your specific role? Because everyone had, like, specific roles. I mean, you guys collaborated on yeah. everything, but what was big specific job? Well, probably a lot of the marketing. You know what I'm saying? I spent a lot of time in the studio, so... You know, Dame will come to the studio after things were made. So me and my brother Hip Hop, uh, creatively, I think um, I had probably more of a, a mark on, on a label. Now, I interviewed Clark Kent recently, mm -hmm. and he told me the story behind Brooklyn's Finest. When I introduced them, it was at the studio when Jay was making the record, which was an hour after Big heard the beat by accident. So I'm just like, you gotta wait. Just wait downstairs in the car. And I'm going to tell him. So I go upstairs, record the song. The song comes out. It's three bars. I mean, it's three verses. It's full. And then I say what I probably should have said at the beginning of the session. Why don't you let me get big on the song? And everybody's looking at me like I'm crazy. And they're acting like, yeah, no, because we don't want to pay Puff. Like Dame was like, fuck that. We ain't paying Puff no money. Plus, we don't know him. And I was like, well, you know I know him. So Jay was like, if you can make it happen, it's all good. And in the background, Dame goes, yeah, but we ain't paying Puff no money. So my thing was, let's try to see if we can make it happen. And if it gets to the point where anything like that goes down and we don't want to pay Puff, then it would have to be big saying this record has to happen. So I went downstairs. I acted like I had to go to the bathroom. I went downstairs. I brought him back up. I got called funny. They were like, yo, you're a funny nigga for the whole session. They met each other. It wasn't even like they had a conversation. They just like started to laugh, clapped hands, because there was a, an insane amount of respect um, for, for each other's craft. Like, they, you don't really have to talk in those moments. I just remember, you know, when after Dead President's video, when, you know, we told Big to call the office the next day at four o'clock, and he called at uh, four o'clock in the dot. Me and um, Dame went to Daddy's house, and we spoke to him about setting up that, um, you know, that session. I mean, Clark, um, besides co-producing it, Dame gave him the sample, and he says he always he never gets credit for the uh, for, for co-producing it. But um, I, it, it got to a point where we couldn't come up with a hook for it. And I remember that was the last song on the album. It was like a deadline, and we gave it to Clark, and he actually came up with the uh, with the hook for it too. So he kind of saved us there. But it was a hard song for Biggie because Biggie didn't really know how to count bars back then, and it was like an off bar. So, you know, Jay went in there and did his whole, his whole uh, verse. He ran it down, and then Biggie came back twice before he finished. Now, now, what do you think was really the chemistry between Jay and Biggie when they first met? In the beginning, right then, at that time, you yeah, think? Yeah, in the beginning. It, it was crazy because it was two super talented individuals respecting each other's craft. So, I mean, Biggie was a, um, he was a force to be reckoned with at the time he was making that. So we're, we're just coming out. But Biggie, and you know, in our eyes, was one of you know, if not um, the the best at that time. So we knew what we had, but the world didn't know. So we know if they'll put them on a the track together, that people be able to see the talent that um, you know that we were seeing. Right now, neither one of them was writing down raps. Neither one of them. So the, the engineer actually came and dropped the pad and put it right between them, 
and then Jay looked at it and pushed it to Big, and then Big looked at it and pushed it back to Jay, and that's the time they found out neither one of them wrote. Okay, and I heard they started kind of pacing around the studio, mumbling to themselves, trying to work out the Yeah, the, the so verses. they was actually at the board together. So they were sitting right together when the, guy, when the engineer dropped that, then they kind of moved their chairs apart, and then you could see Jay kind of mumbling, and you could see Biggie Head just bouncing, you know, to the beat. And when Big finished, he was like, yo, when, when, when I get you to rap on my album, it's going to be a regular beat. It ain't going to be something with four, with, with a fifth bar and all this stuff. Okay. And then, so, Jay laid down his part. And then Big, yeah. Big laid down part of his part and then had to come back a few more no, times. No, he, 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 I think he did, like, maybe three, four bars. Then he came back, heard the beat, then left, and then came back. So it, it, it took him maybe a, a few weeks to finish that. So, but I, I mean, we had so much fun that day. Afterwards, we went to see the Bernie Mac show, you know, sat there, laughed, man. I think we probably went to the Shark Bar. You know, that was one of the big favorite spots. But we, I mean, it was one of the best times because we started to see him and his crew act like us and our crew. You know, the family, the joking with each other and seeing how close they was. And then that kind of let down the guards on both sides and we kind of just embraced each other. Okay, when you guys finished Reasonable Doubt, do you guys know what you had on your hands or? Was it just, we hope y'all see it? We knew we had a great project. I mean, it was still songs on there. I think I've been, you know, I've been saying up to lately. Um, and we, we got these original reels right here. We're going to see if they're in here called The Hot, one song um, mm. that didn't make the album. Even The Hurt didn't make the album. But those lyrics that Jay spit on Black Gangsta, um, that, that, that actually was pre-reasonable doubt. So a lot of people didn't um, know that. That song was called The Hurt. So he, mm. and for him to, you know, to put that song out on Black Gangsta so many years later, and people say this is dope, they don't even know that those lyrics was five, six years old. Now, what, one of the things you said before was that some of your favorite times at Rockefeller were when, when you would put on beats for Jay that he's already done and he would just freestyle. Yeah, free play. Free play. Yeah. So uh, explain that. Yeah, so Jay will go in the studio, say if he's doing politics, and he might lay down a verse or something like that. And we were like, yo, man, let's put a little, you know, give us a little free play or something like that. So he'll go in the booth and then he'll just be spitting for like five or ten minutes straight. And there'll be things that may be going on the album or not going on the album. So that became a thing. And every time he had an album, you know, was in there recording, we might get a little free play. None of it was recorded or anything else like that. It was like... Um, nah, it wasn't recorded. When Jay and Nas started to get into it, uh -huh. and, and Nas dropped Ether, and Jay dropped Takeover, I heard you wanted him to do, you know... Uh, the bridge is over beat instead. Yeah. Which is, I think, one of the hardest hip hop beats of all time. Yeah. On top of that, you know, the bridge is over, Nas being from Queensbridge. Like, why, why didn't that happen? Why, why didn't it happen? Yeah, why didn't it happen? He, um, Irv had came and he already did, um, what was it called, Super? Uh, super Ugly. Yeah, Super Ugly, so he did it. And you know, me and hip hop listened to it, we was like, uh, you know what I mean, it's cool. So on our way home, I was like, yo, the bridge is over. He was like, yeah, that's it. But when we already called down in the studio, the song already went to Hot 97. So they already started playing it. So it was already, you know, too late. So he never laid the, the verse on Bridges Over? No, nah, he never laid it. Because uh, I'll be honest, I always thought the Takeover was better than Ether. I believe Takeover is better than Ether, but um, Ether probably would be better than Super Ugly. But, but the record, that's not the battle. The, the battle really is Takeover and Ether. I always thought that it's Takeover, and everyone always, always tells me I'm wrong. I always thought the Takeover was just a stronger song. Yeah. Yeah, that's my take on it. So you came into this business to actually sell the company. Yeah. So uh, explain that, because most people, when they get into a business, they just want to build it. They're not thinking about selling it. Yeah, well... Our, our, our um, formula was always build to sell companies. You know, that's where you make a lot of your margin, right? These companies don't last forever. So especially at the peak, you try to think about um, a multiple or um, something that, that it's, it'll be worth. So different industries have different standards. Uh, you know, fashion business might be a five multiple or seven multiple, right? Selling five to seven times what it is. Right. And you, you, you know, being in, um, you know, having a, a, a company on, um, on the web, you know what that is, that's probably a 10 multiple, right? So you know like, yeah, right. whatever my, uh, my EBITDA is, right? Earnings before interest and um, appreciation is um, gonna be worth this amount of money. So we went into it 
after selling uh, after um, the reasonable doubt deal to the next deal we had. So we knew that in um, I think it was seven seven years that we would sell a company, and we just knew we had the um, the, the the actual deal didn't kick in until Hard Knock Life. So the funny thing is they thought that we would be on a decline because the life uh, span of a artist at that time was two to three albums. So the deal didn't kick into the second album, but it just so happens we knocked it out the park and sold six million records. <laughs> right. So it raised the value of Def Jam, which was being sold the next year. And Jay probably put another 10 or 15 million in a pocket because there was a, a 25% partner. And then we knew that we had something now because after that, even when we leveled off, you know, within the company selling uh, between five or six million records a year for four or five years straight, um, we had some good money on our hands. Right, because you guys got, I think, 30 million initially? Yeah, and then we did an extension for another three years. Like, how old were you at the time when this $30 million deal came together? Uh, that was 2002, I'm 14, uh, so 11 years ago, I was 31. You're 31 years old and you're worth eight digits. Yeah. Like, like how did that feel at such a young age? I mean, it, it was great to especially do it on, uh, on the legal side, right? Right. <laughs> so, well, um, I mean, it was a great feeling you, to see that all, you, you see the fruits from what you accomplish. So, you know, to put this work in and, I mean, even with that though, it just made us want more. So it, it was cool and it was a great check but the celebration was gonna always, what's the next thing we doing? What's the next thing? Because we were always trying to push the envelope and do things before everybody else. Like, what was it you learned business-wise? Like you mentioned, you would talk to Kanye and Kanye would be like, how would you keep a million dollars? I'd make a million dollars and I'd spend it. Like, what did you learn the most in terms of managing money and keeping it and growing it? Um, watch out um, for investments. Think about um, what you're taking in and what, you, and, and, and what your spend is. So a lot of people, they get money because they think that waterfall is never going to shut off. So, right. you know, we learn that now, you know, after a few businesses, you, you know, especially in the music company, right? You're selling this and we're making, I mean, forget about the sale. We were still probably making between five and eight or sometimes 10 million a year in just royalties. So you think that faucet is never going to run off. So, you know, all the private jets and the triple deck yachts and you're spending all this money. That's probably one of the biggest lessons I learned is to start saving money, right? Because that, that faucet will cut off and think about diversifying and investing in different things. Now, now, what point did you guys realize that the three of you guys were going to start going different directions? Um, that was probably right before the sale um, uh, in 2002, the first one. You know, everybody's head was in a different space. Um, and we had so many companies and so many artists. So around that time, Dane went to Rockaware and he was, um, you know, really running that ship. And, you know, that became a $700 million um, company. And <clears throat> Jay was doing um, a little starting to get into S. Doc Carter. And that's when I just took over Rockefeller by myself. So, you know, every day with the staff and then going into, you know, retail, radio, legal, um, promotion, video, and making sure everything was good from A to Z. And then that's when I started the um, Kanye's project. So I did that project um, A to Z. And Dane would come on if I needed him. If I'm like, yo, I'm having a problem over here, I'm having a problem over here, he might just handle that. But the whole um, project was, um, was, you know, was something that I, you know, I'm glad to say that um, I was a part of. Absolutely. And, and that first project was phenomenal. Yeah, because Dame just thought he could put him on a group and let the group break him. But I seen the genius in what Kanye was doing. And, you know, him having the, the, the uh, he actually had the name of his next three albums. You know, going back and forth with him about singles because it was, a, it was probably a two or three day talk just to get him not to put out Jesus Walks um, instead of before All Falls Down. So that's mm -hmm. something I had to really get in his mind. Like, they're not ready for this right now. You don't want to come with the second single to be Jesus Walks. Yeah, yeah. I remember I'd interviewed Kanye right when Slow Jams was about to come out. Through the Wire was out, and it was buzzing. And what I always remember, because I lost the interview, was that the way Kanye is today was exactly how he was back then. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that, and they ask that question yeah. all the time. You know, how is Kanye? I was like, exactly the same. He has a, a bigger platform to speak on. So instead of now speaking to 30, 40 people, he's speaking to 30 and 40,000. No, absolutely. You know, you guys start working, working on different things, but at one point did you decide that you guys are actually splitting apart and going your separate ways completely? Uh, after the second sale around 2005. 
2004, 2005. Okay. Where did you go after that? Uh, me and Dame, we started um, Dame Dash uh, uh, Music Group, and we had uh, Dash Films, and we had Creative Control, um, a marketing company, and then I started uh, Block Savvy, and at the time I still had my vodka company, Armadale. So Armadale was just yours? It was, it was all of us, but um, me and um, Dame, we had put it together. I'm, I'm only naming these projects because these are the ones that I started, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, somebody might have a vision for something we might be partners for, but these were all like my babies. Okay. And then you guys sold Rockaware. Yeah. Now, how much did that sell for again? 204. 204 million. Yeah. So now, now moving from Rockware, you have your own clothing brand, but you have a bunch of clothing brands. Yeah, so, I, well, I have a new company, it's, it's BDRC, which is the holding company, and under that there's several brands, but it's just like, re our reasonable doubt is 4th of November. So, 4th of November is going to be the one that launches all these other brands, and, you know, like I've been telling people, I'm lucky, I just, you know, we got some new numbers in, and we had 7 million in um, six months now, so we did um, 2 million over this last month, but, I mean, the jeans is selling out, everybody wants it, you know, all over the place, and we just did a big shipment um, over in Europe, that just kind of blew out of stores and, you know, kind of took it from America on its first delivery, but we're bringing it back now um, on 11-15. Now, now, what's different about this company than the other companies you've started before? I have experience. <laughs> so all the other companies, I didn't know anything about music getting into it. I didn't know anything about tech getting into Block Savvy, anything about spirits getting into Armadale, or even the sporting business when we had Rock Sports. Um, now, after all experience, you know, I, I know the um, importance of putting a, a good team together, putting a board um, together, um, watching the financials and, 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 and paying attention to the small things and being uh, more concentrated and, and a little more, um, uh, you know, thinking about the, the, the moves that we're making a little more. And it's not revolved around an artist. So I, don't, I didn't want to go back that route again and try to have a face of the brand because a lot of times when something happens to that, it, it dilutes the brand or it can, um, you know, bring the brand down. So I was like, I want the line to kind of live by itself. Sure. Now, I mean, do you have any inkling as to how, how prominent Kanye is going to be in the world of fashion? You know, like, 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 like the, the effect of Yeezys no. is, is, is monumental. It's, it's crazy, but we had an idea too because Rockaway at the time was going to do the first clothing line. When he, when for, he had the, for, uh, for yeah, Kanye. Yeah, when he had the, uh, the little teddy bear. Right, right. I actually heard that Echo was supposed to do something too. Echo was supposed to do well, some sort of yeah, teddy bear deal but, where you know, with, obviously with we had everything under, you know, under the house. umbrella. So we had um, kind of first crack at it, but you know how Kanye is, um, and they designed a whole collection. Then he was like, no, I don't like it. <laughs> Wait, so you guys designed a whole Rockwear collection for Kanye? Yeah, it wasn't Rockwear. It? it was under his brand, and I, 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 I can't think of the name right now. Was that Pastel? Yeah, my pastel. Pastel. So you guys did a whole pastel, and he was just like, nah. Yeah. Wow. That, that's quite a story. Yeah. When, when you look at Kanye's effect on Adidas, like he's literally lifting this entire brand. It's been around for like, what, 60, 70 years? Yeah, but that's, you know, what I, and when I go back, it's this um, collaboration we did with 4th of November and, um, and Rock 96, and it's the Reasonable Doubt family tree. And uh -huh. right. The reason why it was to the, the, the show people the impact that we had on music. But the idea in the beginning wasn't just music. It was about businesses, the interns that turned to execs, and how this family tree spurs out way bigger than what people think it is. I mean, if you think about Lee Daniels, you know, we fund his first directorial debut. And now look right. where he is, right? So even in films, Kevin Hart, right? We, we put him on. So we found Kevin Hart, put him in his first thing. So it's so many people that's on his family tree. But the... Um, Going back, oh, yeah, even Shaka, she just walked in. She's on the family tree now, too. So she's, right. uh, yeah, president of Rock Nation. But, mm -hmm. you know, all these people that had all this success and, and, and where things have went right now, it's, it's, it's one of the best things that, you know, it's one of the things that we're really celebrating today. Right. I mean, when you look back at what you've accomplished, what do you think were some of the biggest mistakes you made? Obviously, you learned from them, but what was the actual mistakes in retrospect? I think, you know, I just talked about today, I think our biggest mistake probably was with Kanye when Lior told us he didn't believe in a project and said we could take him to another label. So we went to another label and we was like, these guys are idiots too, so we might as well keep him there. So if we would have did that deal, we would have still been in the Kanye business. So going, since we took him back and put him on, on back on there, it went into our regular deal. So, you know, we didn't see the, um, you know, we didn't see the fruits of that. 
Um, but yeah. oh yeah, what I was saying about um, Kanye before his impact on it and reasonable doubt in the family tree is not only him building up um, Adidas, but if you think about what Rihanna is doing with Puma years later, and Reasonable Doubt still have this impact because of the, uh, the artists that came from this family tree and they're doing what we did um, on a bigger level. Right, because actually like this year, I've been holding, I mean, my biggest holding was Nike. For five years, I've been buying it nonstop. And then this year, when I found out that Kanye was re-upping on his deal with Adidas, I literally sold all my Nike stock and bought all Adidas. That's how much I believe in it. That's because I can see the effect, not just of the shoes, but of the perception yeah of the brand. Yeah, and that's what, you know, to keep going back to the uh, family tree, but that's our effect on the world, right? W w why I say reasonable doubt and people, you know, um, may have some um, something to say about it is the, the strongest uh, uh, lifestyle or movement or Rockefeller or Rock 96 is the strongest thing of all time because it went so far beyond music. So, you know, some guys did one or two deals outside of music, but if you look at the trickle down effect, I mean, it's like reasonable doubt was the thing that took over the world when you look at, at the bottom of that family tree right now. You know, even with the J. Cole, the Kanye coming and the Pusher and Designer and, you know, John Legend and Big Sean, good music, like everybody's is still relevant. I mean, the thing that I always found so special about what you guys do was that you guys had such an effect by just the slightest comment. Yeah. Like, you know, like, we, we don't buy X5s, we give them to baby mamas. Yeah, that's funny, that, and Jay got that because I had, I had bought that for my, uh, yeah, my, son's, my son's mother. Um, oh, oh, that came from you? Yeah, for, uh, for Valentine's Day gift. But after that, no man wanted to drive an X5. <laughs> I know. Yeah. It, it was the most fucked up thing ever because that was like my favorite car at the time. Mm -hmm. I was going to be made fun of if I drive that yeah. because of y'all. Yeah. Uh, like, how do you feel? Like, I mean, you know, like Jay would wear his hat a certain type of way. You would see everyone wear their hats. He would wear a button up. Everyone would start wearing button yeah. ups. Like, like in retrospect, how do you think you had that type of effect? Uh, and we thought, I mean, we were cocky like that, like I said, going into it because of the lifestyle we had before music. So we went into it. We knew that everybody would follow us. It's just that the, we had like Kanye, we had a bigger platform because now we could talk about the things we were doing. And we were talking about things that we were doing before other people knew about it. And it's just like right now on the internet, the gift of discovery. So people hear these things and then they kind of discover this new uh, platinum, this uh, champagne or the Range Rover, the 4.6, and they want to be a part of that. Everybody wants to be a part of discovery to say, oh yeah, I heard about, I just heard about something and go check it out for themselves. Right, and you guys were there before there was an internet doing yeah. the same thing. It's amazing. Yeah. Now, you want to offer the first ever consumer goods IPO? Yeah, we did that with uh, StockX, so um, we, we, I heard about... Oh, you're, you're part of StockX. Um, well, we did, we, what we did is offer some exclusive items through them. So, you know, they have their, their consumer IPO, and we did is partner with them to have an um, exclusive uh, 4th of November and Reasonable Doubt to be sold or they site. At the time, they were only doing sneakers. So now anything besides sneakers, all the clothes, we had the exclusive deal and we did that first with them. You know, like I said, we like to do things first so, and push the envelope. So we, we went there and um, I spoke with uh, Josh and some of the team over there. I like what they was doing. I thought it was a good opportunity for us. What do you think is the future in terms of what you're doing so far in terms of clothing and so forth? I feel like the internet's completely changed the way you buy clothes. I'll order something I like in like two or three different sizes, try on what I want, and send everything else back. Yeah, and then send back, right? Yeah. Ten, ten years ago, no one did this. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing as the, as the gift of discovery. So now everybody's like on trying to see what they like. I think um, the big box retails, even that, you know, they're not doing as good as um, they used to. You can see the numbers at Macy's, right, and how you know, right. their, their, their stock has been going down. So I hope you don't, I hope you don't own any of that. But, <laughs> but um, it's the same thing. I mean, uh, it's, you know, urban kind of turning the streetwear, which is big right now. Supreme probably being the behemoth in, the, in, in that space. But, um, you know, a lot of it is uh, kind of, uh, you know, everything is do it yourself. Everybody's looking at, um, you know, how to take advantage of, of just, you know, making your own product and, and selling it online and, and the vertical, just how to make the most money yourself. Yeah, I know 2 Chains did well with the whole CEO brand. 
Yeah. That he did. He definitely did his thing. And you're still a one-third owner of Reasonable Doubt. Yeah. Now, I heard at one point Jay wanted to buy out you and Dame. Yeah. Dame, yeah, Dame came back and mentioned it. I was like, I'm never letting go Reasonable Doubt. You're never going to sell it? No. Why is that? I mean, that's something I hold dear to my heart. So it's not even about the money. Um, it's about the thing that, that put me in a different space. And, you know, as I keep talking about um, all the things, the relationships that got built, the businesses that got built, uh, uh, the frame of mind that came from that, the lifestyle I was living, um, is something that I, you know, that I, that I wanted to be a part of um, for the rest of my life. And I'll probably just pass that down to my son. Now, when Jay became president of Def Jam, they gave him his entire catalog. Uh-huh. Now, did I'm you guys not, I'm feel... I'm not sure if they gave it to him. I'm not sure how it worked. But did I, they give him his master's when he became president of Def Jam? Wasn't that part of the deal? I, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, no, I'm not really sure about that. Okay. All right. Maybe I'm wrong. I heard it was something like that. Mm -hmm. I heard that the Reasonable Doubt Master was the only one that he didn't own outright. Yeah. Any That's idea? true. But I'm just saying I don't know how the deal was. Ah, okay, so Jay does own the masters of all the other albums. Yeah. How, how do you manage that? Because you guys worked on all of it together. Um, like I said, I don't know how the deal worked with that. You know? I mean, when it's all said and done, like, what are you the most proud of in terms of the um, mark that you left on the world? I think the legacy um, for me in the mark is for the interns, like I think I spoke about this earlier, to see... Shaka, who used to work um, on our video department, become a president. You know, Tata, who was real instrumental on building the whole Rockefeller up to be a co-founder of Rock Nation. Emery Jones to be the lifetime, the lifestyle specialist. Uh, Christy to be back in the fold doing management. Emmanuel, uh, you know, at head over there in Atlantic and Shari Bryant. To see all these kids, G. Robeson, hip hop, to build these big companies but more or less to see the relationships that we had with people, how we kept everything family and try to do things fair and to emulate that and to be successful themselves. I, when you think of your top three songs on Rockefeller from any of the artists, I mean, your absolute top three songs, you know, what would they be? That, that's really hard. But um, I know. Uh, probably It's On with Jay and Beans. Okay. Um, for Jay, I mean, that's, you know what, Encore. And, and, and as I was listening to that the other day, it was like, because it, it kind of summed up everything. So, you know what I mean? Like, he did that so perfectly. I don't know, Welcome to New York City with Jay and Cam. I mean, it's, that, that can change, so I hope everybody don't listen to that. Like, man, that's the three. But uh, that's just what came to mind right now. Because I'm, I'm in the New York state of mind. I'm in D&D studio right now. I remember there was one interview where Jay said that Beanie Siegel would go down as one of the mm -hmm. all-time greats up there with Tupac. Um, and I truly believe that. I, I still believe it. What do you think happened where, where Beanie didn't really get to the level that, that a lot of us felt that he should get at? Um, that's a good question. I'm not sure. I don't know um, if it was a song choice um, on our part or whatever it is. But we talked about that the other day. I definitely don't think that Beans get the, um, the credit that he deserves. I, I right. definitely think that he's a tremendous lyricist. And when you really sit down, a lot of people just don't understand him. But when you sit down and you break down his lyrics for people who understand what he's saying, it's, it's phenomenal. And that's why I used to like him and Jay on songs together because he rises to, you know, to, this, to this level and it kind of matches wits. It's never, you know, these songs where you like, man, Jay killed him or, or anything like that. It's like, damn, who won that? It's like, it's kind of going back and forth. It brings me back to that DMX and Jay-Z battle. Like, I remember when I interviewed um, Clark Kent, at one point, Tupac took a shot at Jay-Z. Well, you mentioned in a previous interview that Jay-Z had a Tupac disc record that never got released. Yeah, it never got released. No. But he performed it live at the Apollo one day we was doing the show. I heard about that. Yeah. We actually tried to get that footage, but we couldn't, we couldn't get it. Yeah, that was, it was tough. Well, what was the feeling at Rockefeller when this whole thing was happening? Because I heard that y'all were fans of Tupac. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we knew that it, it was something that we had to step up to the plate. He ended, up did, he ended up releasing a little something called Dead or Alive, and that's out there. And um, that was actually about, you know, going back at Tupac. But, um, I mean, you know, we wanted to step up to the occasion. We knew that Jay had him. 
uh, you, you know, but at that time it was like, you know, nobody really cared um, which way it went. Meaning, you know, if it was on vinyl or not, you know, everybody was um, kids then, but, uh, we, you know, for us, I mean, we're glad that it didn't get to that place with them too.